This is a brand new presentation of, of mine, though I've been traveling for 20 years, so it was really, it was so fun um, to look at over 20 years of travels that I've been doing um, and to really look back and kind of pick out the ones, the examples um, that I thought could help you guys explore more with your travel photography. The, you know, travel photography is probably, when we think of photography and what we want to do, I want to be a photographer. Most of our dreams are probably, I want to be a Nat Geo photographer who travels the world, is on assignment for like anywhere, minimum a month and a half to maybe a year. That's sort of, I think, a very, you know, if you ask about 80% of photographers, that's what they'll say. And, you know, travel photography has all that, you know, that allure and that, that, that uh, to it, but it is the mo some of the most difficult photography that you could do because you have to have skills in all sorts of photography. You have to be a good portrait photographer. You have to be a good landscape photography. If you choose to go to destinations where there's wildlife, a good wildlife photography, you know, a good street shooter. Because a good, an excellent travel photographer is taking the best aspects of all those and then some to create a wonderful story, a wonderful presentation of this journey that they've gone on. They're gonna share this journey, this trip with you you know, so again, all those aspects and then some to make a really great travel photographer. So I've been lucky enough, um, I've been traveling since I was a kid, you know. Um, I traveled, I had parents that were on both sides of the country. So I was, you know, driving or flying across country many, for many, many years and, and enjoying our national parks and road trips. So it's sort of been a part of who I am um, since the beginning. But I've been really f doing photography and travel photography for, like I've said, about 20 years. And I lived in Europe um, for nine months, lived in the Mediterranean, and really got to explore that in the early, as I like to say, I was in, mainly in Greece, so I was back then in the drachma days. So, so when I could live in, in actually Greece for, I think I, I lived in Greece for $2,000 for nine months, and yet still traveled all over the Mediterranean. Hard to do that now, but again, I wanted to share some of my experiences my, uh, hopefully my tips that can hopefully enrich in your next journey. So this one is, um, just, I really love, this is one of my favorite pictures. I'm not really a people person. I'm, uh, as far as, I'm sorry, people photographer. Um, I'm more known for a lot of my landscapes or nightscapes or cityscapes. That's kind of what I'm known for. But when you go to countries like India, if you don't shoot people, then I don't know what you're shooting because the people are there. They want to be photographed. You know, they're very interest. You know, they're very interesting to photograph in all the different scenarios. It's a, a total mind. And the, the most difficult thing about India, I think, is that people also want to photograph you. You know, especially if you look somewhat different. And my hat stood out. You know, like nobody's business there. And everyone was like, I'd say, oh, I decided to take a picture, and I'd have a, a line of people waiting to take a picture of me. <laughs> with me, you know, I was just like, oh, okay, you know, but again, the dialogue and sharing and the conversations that came out of it made a wonderful and a, and a wonderful experience. This is a, a couple tips on this one. This is in Varanasi, which is a very, very special place um, in, um, in India. It's one of the most holiest sacred cities. Everyone needs to go to Varanasi. Um, if, you're, if you're a Hindu, you go to Varanasi, you have to make that trek during your lifetime. Um, the Ganges River flows right through it, and that's where you're usually going to. Um, we stayed at a hotel. I traveled this. Uh, I did this trip with my dad and some uh, some friends. It was definitely a photocentric centric um, trip because my dad and I are both photographers. Um, and this was a, something we planned early in the morning. We wanted to take a boat ride upon the Ganges, and the, you know, just to get that early morning light. And if you can. You know, take advantage of those magic hours just as twilight is breaking and seeing the city awaken. That was what this, what this hour long journey was, was watching Varanasi wake up and see it go from that early twilight and dusk to seeing the lights, you know, come off or turn or to come on and, and as well as turn off and as well as everyone kind of uh, migrating to the, to the Ganges to take their their ritual morning bath, and, and just it was just an amazing experience. And this gentleman laid, led us on the trip, and even though I was on a boat with about six or seven other people, you know, I really, the way I framed this, I made sure that I put him right in the center and kind of kneeled down it and composed it with the lights behind him so to make it seem like he was this 
this person that's just bringing you on this trip, wherever you know you go. So I really, this was a very special morning. This was one of my favorite shots that I got from the whole trip. Um, and it was just, and it was kind of easy to do if you know a few of the things, like getting up early in the morning. This would have been a totally different image at noon, you know, and there's just a softer, more mysterious light in that early morning. So a little bit more about me. This is who I am. This is one of my favorite travel portraits. That's me in the Galapagos, um, playing with some mockingbirds. Um, if you want to follow me, my personal website is ruinism.com. I'm also on all the the major social channels, um, mainly on Facebook and on Instagram. I have a few copies of my book, or you can also purchase them at uh, b &H as well. Uh, but I have my book, Night Photography, From Snapshots to, uh, to Great Shots, uh, that came out in 2014. Um, and it's really a great entry level to intermediate if you're really interested in night photography, which I'll be definitely, we'll be talking about the magic of night photography and how it can you know, level up your travel photography as well. Uh, my main focus really, um, has been, as David mentioned, National Parks at Night. This is something that I co-founded about a year and a half ago with a good friend, with four really good friends of mine. Um, and we are not, we're the founders, but we're the teachers and we run the whole business. But our, our mission is to basically go to every national park um, in the United States, as well as outside the United States. And we're leading a workshop at each one of these national parks only once. There's 59 that we need to get through. So at least, you know, that's a 10 year plan plus again, um, some of the international trips as well. But we want to share these places, uh, and we'll be doing different sort of uh, trips on, on them with the focus of night photography, but some will be camping and sort of hiking and adventure. Others will be full immersion during the day and the night. Um, one of the cool ones we're going on, I think this year that I just announced was uh, Dry Tortugas. Everyone even hear, heard of Dry Tortugas National Park? It's the most southern national park in the United States. If you go as far south as you can in Florida, you go to Key West, and then you go 70 miles west in a boat of that. It's a beautiful little island that has a fortress that's built like the Brooklyn Bridge. It was built you know, during you know, the 1860s. Um, I think it took 20 or 30 years to build, but the, the, it's lasted the lashings of the Gulf you know, for that many years and it's a really wonderful, beautiful place, but we'll be staying on a boat for that trip, as well as exploring um, the park and inside the walls of Fort Jefferson at night, which is a very, very rare um, thing to have access to. So these are the ways you can follow us. If you sign up for our mailing list, you get a free ebook with 20 tips on night photography as well. So there's that information. Um, I wanted to take you through just a, a couple slides first. Um, I'm from San Francisco. And you know it's it's interesting. You know we talk about travel photography and going to all these exotic and wonderful places, but let's not also forget we live in New York City. Other people live in San Francisco. There's some wonderful cities that we live in that we really don't take advantage of unless maybe we have friends or family visiting and we and we play tourist with them. So don't forget that in our backyard we have a destination. We have a place that so many people are coming to. So take advantage of what's in your backyard. Those pictures can be just as amazing as, what you, as planning a, a, a two, four, six week expedition somewhere else. So living in San Francisco, um, I had been there for, I, I lived there for over like 15 years. And on my last, one of my last trips back, I was like, you know, I wanna go back. I had, an, I remembered, uh, this spot in Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is the highest location um, in San Francisco. And most people go up there and they'll see this. And this is beautiful. And I, of course, I went there during sunset and I got this shot, but I was there with 50, 60, 70 other people. And we we're getting this shot. And maybe my equipment was better, maybe their equipment was better, but we're, for the most part, we're jockeying and vying for the same shot. And yes, it could be during a magic hour, a magic time, that you capture something a little bit more unique. Um, but it's always good to do your research, you know, and kind of get a lay of the land, get there early. I knew I was going there to take what was behind this, which no one else took a picture of uh, that, that day. And I've seen very little of these shots yet. But and as beautiful as this is, if you climb up the hill, you'll look at the other peak and you can get something like this. And this is a 15 minute exposure um, that uh, I had to wait, I had to wait. I sat up there and it was super windy and I kind of put myself in a little crevice there and I put my tripod down. I used a six stop neutral density filter because I needed 
I really needed the time to get to 15 minutes. That was sort of the magic time for me to get enough car trails coming and going to kind of even out. I could have stacked numerous ones to get it that way as well, um, but I really wanted to get it, I'm, I'm an all in, all, get it done in the camera kind of guy. Anyway, so this was sort of, again, knowing the place and not, don't forget, you know, we all go to so, all, all these destinations, all these places, and it's obvious what's in front of us. And take that shot, go ahead, take that shot. It's a wonderful memory, it's a reason why thousands of people flock there. But then relax, you know, and look around. Look up, look down, look all around you because there's other magical things there as well. So if we explore more, take a few more steps and explore that, wonderful things can be revealed. So speaking of that, what kind of explorer are you? There's many different ways that we can enjoy a journey. Are you a type of person that likes to travel solo? You like to, you like to create your own itinerary, do your own research, and then go out for that adventure, not worrying about being distracted by family or friends, you know, and you can kind of just set your own thing. That has its benefits, you know, for sure. We can kind of really stay focused. But again, the drawbacks of something like that are, are also you're only gonna get this point of view. There's a wonderful thing that can happen when we actually travel with either family that understands our, our need to take photographs or friends that we, ha we share that same common interest in, in getting up early or staying out late or doing both and, and really going on a sort of a photocentric trip. You know, and you can bounce off ideas off of that person. That, that's another equation that we can add to it and it will usually reveal again, a fuller story, a richer story, because now we have two people on assignment, or more, that are kind of working that same scene. This is a, a, a shot I, I took with, uh, it was actually a day off uh, during uh, b and uh, on, on a B&H trip, so there's three of us, three coworkers who I call my good friends as well, and we had a day off, so we're like, we wanted, we were in Portland, Oregon, we wanted to, we'd been to the coast before, so we wanted to go a little bit farther north. We wanted to go to Astoria, a really beautiful scenic area of Oregon. But, and this is the only day we had. You know, a lot of our travels are subject to the time frame that we selected, and I'm only in this, our itinerary is we're only here, you know, this day. So that no matter rain or, or, or rain, snow, sleet, whatever, that's gonna be our day to, to enjoy it. And the same was, was with this. This was, the forecast was with 100, and if we could get to 100, 110% chance rain, it would have been that. It was gonna rain, 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 all day, all night. We just brought our rain gear. Um, I remember Paige, we actually stopped by a, 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 a hardware store and got her like the, the yellow <laughs> slicker of the whole outfit and everything. Um, but we just, like, we're here, what else are we gonna do? You know, we're not gonna just stay in our hotels and sulk. So we decided to just barrel, you know, barrel through. And this was one of the, it was cool. I was like, I pulled in, I was driving here and I pulled into this empty parking lot because no one else is, is doing as silly a thing as we're doing and going out to the beach during the rain. And I just, I saw that arrow. And that, that, the way that rain can make things glisten and glow, I, I slapped, you know, I stopped put on the drakes and I said, I want this picture of this arrow pointing. And again, if I was alone, that's all I'd get. But because I was with friends, I said, Paige, we'd be really great if you like, you know, went back, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 feet and just jumped in the air. You know, just be as happy as you could be, you know, and do that. And so we, we planned it, for, we, we set it up and we communicated, you know, through the wind and the rain. Um, and this is obviously a far better shot, I think, than just having the arrow in the parking lot, you know. So again, bouncing off either people who are patient with you, hopefully are, Husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, if we're traveling with you, they've learned to be a little patient with your photography instead of being like, come on already, we've been at this spot for already two hours. How many more shots are you gonna get? You know, or friends that are like, oh, let's, let's really you know, dive into this scene and see what we can get. And another frequent travel uh, scenario is what we're going with a bunch of friends. Maybe we're going, for, in this instance, I was going to a wedding in Crete. Now, I'd never been to Crete before this, even though I lived in Greece for a while, and I'm not gonna give up a, you know, an opportunity to do that. And so I definitely carved out some time you know, that I could go and do my shoot. I went to Knossos to go. I tried to find the labyrinth. I tried to find the bull, you know, as well as all, I love ancient history and all that sort of stuff, so I, I love the ruins there. But 
I was also on call. They had a photographer, but I was also really on call while the while the their hire photography was there to do some of the group shots, to do some of that. And you know what? That's that is something that I I found was missing in a lot of my photography. If you look at my early, as I was looking actually at my early travel photography, there's no people in it. I was really interested in ruins, you know, museums, structures, you know, all the the, the typical stuff, the sites, and maybe I'd interpret it different. But I would only use people as scale occasionally, you know, and you know people are uncontrollable. We we can't control them as you know, so they're they can be. A, a nuisance in the scene, or if you embrace it, it really can be a wonderful thing. So, you know, again, if you're along, if you're if you're going on some sort of a, a, a travel, and it's for a family gathering or a wedding or something like that, just make sure you carve out your little time. You know, embrace the the other obligations you'll probably have to do as a photographer. You know, for that. And then, then this was a great. You know, the, the couple who got married here, Tony and Despina, they love this group shot. This was one of their favorite shots from it. And I was like, I didn't, they didn't even ask. I saw everyone, we were, this was our day off before the wedding. Everyone was hanging out at the beach. I said, come on, we have to get everyone together to really, you know, we need that, that memory. You know, let's not forget, you know, we're, not, we're all, not only making art, but we're making memories, you know. So, but it's a matter of are we, you know, are we capturing or are we creating the balance between them. And then here's a group shot from our, one of our workshops in Crater Lake with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and National Parks at Night. This was our last night. Um, I, you'll see a few of these shots. I really like 360 degree photography as well. Um, and I take this, um, I took this one with the Rico Theta. Um, it's a $300 simple point and shoot. Um, easy to use, 360 degree camera. I love it. I, and, and the latest rendition actually can do some halfway decent work um, at night. This is about probably, I think, about a four or six second exposure. I had everyone hold still with their flashlights. And this is, our, again, our group shot. But again, capturing those memories and those adventures. And again, going on a dedicated photo workshop, well, then that's really, that's the sort of, either you're going solo and having your own agenda, or you're going on you know, a photo workshop or an expedition that's going with syncing up with things that you want to do, whether it's wildlife, whether it's dedicated to night photography, whether it's dedicated to just doing that immersion into that country or that city or that place that you want to go. Any of those reasons, we still need to do research. Research is the key thing for travel photography. You, want, you need to do at least four to five times as amount of research as you are going to be spending in this time. Now, this is the sweater gang from Finland. And you know, I only knew that I needed to get this sweater. Wow, I got this sweater here. And it kind of inspired everyone else to, to get the sweater um, so we could fit in a little bit more with the, with the locals. Um, but uh, you really have to do a lot of research. And there's a few th obvious things that are out there. I mean, obviously, we can go to our magazines, you know, all the tra different travel magazines that are out there. Those are great inspiration. Those might make us aware of new locations, hot locations places that are not going to have a thousand people you know, lined up in the early morning to do. Um, so the magazines are great, um, but also let's not forget that how are we seeing images more than ever is with our social channels, using Facebook, or I, I really like um, Instagram for, as a search engine for places. If you put the hashtag and like say I want to go to Iceland, I put the hashtag Iceland, and I just see all these images, there are people have gone all over the world and they're tagging hashtag Iceland. Or when you hashtag and you start to type in the word, I discovered that discover Iceland was one of the most sort of trending hashtags. So you can see how many people are using those hashtags. And that's good for you to know because when you go there, you could be using that, those hashtags as well so that you could be getting a good social response as well. But it's, it's a great way. I'm finding a ton of new locations this way. This is sort of the, the, uh, right, the, non, the, uh, the, the, the unknown or the, where you know, people are finding sort of the secret spots. You can find these sort of locations um, in, in Instagram using the hashtag. You can also do it um, with Pinterest. A lot of people are using Pinterest to kind of just putting up pretty pictures of, of places or things that they want to go. So using that, and also just Google, regular Google, and look at images. Not only, you know, whenever I go to some place, um, usually in America, I always do 
things to do in Asheville, top places to eat, top places to see, top places to, you know, and just, there's many ways we can Google it, either top places, top 10, top 20, or things to do. All these will yield, you know, different sort of lists from these. So I kind of look at all these different lists, see what is, is, is uh, you know, constantly being, especially for the restaurants and stuff like that, you can see what's co continually be coming up. Um, and that can also yield a nice and a richer, more rewarding experience for, for the, that research that you're gonna do on that, on that location. Again, Pinterest as well. A couple places, now what do you have a passion for? Because it's also, if we go, like my first time to Europe, I went and I just did what most people do, I think the first time they're in the country, they go to the museums, they go to the, the holy, the, 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 like the churches and all these other places that are kind of like the staple places to go. But what do you like? What do you like to do? What's your interest? A lot of people now are traveling with those interests in mind. There's dedicated like yoga excursions. There's dedicated trips, foodie trips, wine trips, all these different sort of things. What do you like? And maybe there's A, a trip catered to you or you can unearth that in these different locations. I went to Madrid last year. And when we think of Madrid, we think of like tapas, we think of, you know, and wine a lot as far as the food. But I was like, you know what, maybe they have craft beer there. I'm a craft beer guy. And so I, I Googled craft beer Madrid, and craft beer had really just made inroads you know, into Madrid, but it, was, it had a, a good underground following. And so I made sure that I hit all these sort of craft cerveza places all, all around there. And it really was a cool thing because I was with like mine. I got to talk to the owners. They showed me around, and it was a really wonderful and rewarding experience. I also like quirky things. I like sort of, you know, the, that, those things that, uh, again, might not seem, they, they seem a little, like, the, it's like the flip of the coin. When we think of a coin, I'm think, I'm, when we think of, I want to see what's on the other side of that coin. So a couple of my favorite research tools are um, the website, Atlas Obscura, which I actually brought their book uh, this holiday season. They actually compiled a bunch of their blog writing, and they came out with this book, so feel free to come take a look at this book, but this is sort of um, a really cool guide to the, the, the strange, the weird, the unknown on these sort of locations. So I'm all, and it's a great way. I, they have an app too, it's a bit clunky. So I basically am using their website and it can use, you know, you can type in where you're gonna be, the location, the zip code or the country or something like that, and it'll show you what's near you. I was in Ecuador recently and I kind of planned a couple trips to see different like ruins and sites because it was on you know Atlas Obscura. Here for the states, um, I'm, I'm a, like a Route 66 guy. I like those kind of things. And Roadside America, this is the exact opposite of Atlas Obscura. It's a horrible website, but a wonderful app. <laughs> and it's an app that it's a. Uh, I think you either pay like five bucks for, per region, or you pay twenty bucks and you get all of the United States forever. Um, but it is, um, they have a ton of really interesting things um, that, that you could do. You can even explore New York, you know, with it. And it shows you where all like the, 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 the muffler, you know, mannequins that are all out on, the, on some of the, the uh, cars, uh, the uh, used car sales and all this sort of stuff like that. It's really unique and uh, quirky and a fun way to kind of guide your way through a, pl uh, through a place, even if it's a place that you are familiar with. So those are my two uh, recommended obscure sort of apps to use for that. So, and here's, here's a prime example. I went to uh, Scotland. I did this trip about four or five years ago with my mom, and I kind of let her guide. It was kind of her trip, and I let her guide the thing. But I did some basic research, you know, and I knew we were going to be in Edinburgh, and I, I discovered um, this bridge in the Forth of Firth, and it's like this bridge is practically it's almost as old as the Brooklyn Bridge. But instead of being built with those huge, you know, stone bricks, this was built with metal, and it is something to witness. And I really like I like bridges. I like these sort of these these structures. Um, as and so I said, you know, let's do let's if we if you don't mind, it looks like it's just an easy, thirty minute, you know, uh, bus ride out of Edinburgh, we, if we could just plan an afternoon to do this. And my mom was like, sure, of course, let's do it. So we got there, and we also noticed that they did boat tours to this island that would go under the bridge. I was pretty happy with this shot, this panoramic shot, but I was like, whoa, if I can go under the bridge and kind of use a boat to kind of get closer, 
that'd be great. And then we also found out that there was this ruined abbey on this island that they would do daily tours to. I said, let's go check that out. I like ruins, you know. So we did this, we did this tour, got under the bridge, and actually my favorite shot was, was this one, inside the abbey. Um, and we spent, we ended up spending pretty much the whole day out in this area, which was also just a little small town, right? We had the best fish and chips while we were there at this little town, and we kind of just walked around this town. It had already yielded such fruitful rewards with the picture taken. I said, let's, it's, you know, let's take advantage of this quaint little seaside town and walk around. And we got some really great fo fo uh, food, photos, and again, this was one of my favorite, favorite shots from that trip. So being open and let people and food kind of guide you along your trip. Uh, this was the best looking rickshaw um, that I saw in India, and I had these guys, these guys pick me up and drove me back to my, uh, my hotel one night, and I, I was attracted to them anyways. I, I flagged them down, obviously easy to see with all the, all the uh, LEDs on it, and I was like, when they dropped me off, we were kind of chatting as best we could on the, uh, on the way, and I was just so enthralled too that the two guys were just, you know, it's, a rickshaw can't fit a lot of people. And the two guys were best of buds and just sitting, you know, right up there. So as soon as I got out, I said, look, I got to take a portrait of you guys, if you don't mind. They were like, sure, it's great. And so they stood around and, you know, had them turn on, make sure all the lights were on and stuff like that. And it was really, really, it yielded a wonderful, wonderful result. And again, if, who, who here has, has uh, taken part in a Turkish breakfast? It is like an amazing, minimal seven-course meal, oftentimes up to 10 or 15 of little things. Um, and again, experiencing that, you know, making sure if a region or a place is famous for some sort of culinary thing, take part in that. And the experience, the people that you'll meet either at that restaurant or if it's a ritual going to a luau in, in, in Hawaii or something like that, you know, it's super fun. And, 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 and remembering those little details like the food we ate, the people we met, you know, that just that helped us along this journey is a wonderful, wonderful memory. So letting food and people guide you, but also looking at um, when there's festivals in regions and either planning to go during those festivals or avoiding those festivals. Because sometimes, obviously, hotels can be hard to get if, if masses of people are coming to these events anyways. Um, that could be tricky. Or if you're going to go to India during holy season and you're not prepared for all of, you know, all the color and everything that's going to, if you don't have your camera gear protected, you're going to be in trouble. You know, but finding out these festivals, I'm now doing that research. You know, when I know I'm going to go to a certain country or city, when are these when are these festivals kind of going on? When are these events going on? And either planning a, a specific trip to take part in that, or again, if it's something that doesn't match up with things that I like, or it's a, it's a big inundation on the city, then I might kind of avoid it at that time. Again, we're back to Varanasi here, um, and this is a festival. I believe they had every I believe it was every night at seven o'clock. So this was sort of a, a lucky thing that it was happening every night. They had this ritual by the Ganges River, and it was uh, all about five of these, five to seven of these guys lined up, and you know every, there's so many people here, and and I was able to weave in, you know, no one said a thing. I was going right up to these guys and taking pictures, and it was not a problem. So you know that's always a, a question. You know there was really no security. There wasn't a lot of people doing that. But if they were to tell me to back off, I would have gladly back off. But sometimes you, you have to kind of feel out the limitations before, you know, if you're just sitting back. If I just had stayed in the 10th row, 20th row back, I wouldn't have been able to get these kind of shots. So, um, and also the season. When is the proper season? When's the right season? When's the best season? Don't go to India during monsoon season, you know? Or go really, really prepared because there's very few shots of that during during monsoon season. You know, go and taking advantage of the auroras, right? You, those can happen any time after September and usually go till about April, but really the prime months to see the northern lights, the farther you can go up to the uh, Arctic Circle, the better, but the prime time is usually September, October, and that sort of February, Marchish time. That's sort of when the axis of the Earth just allows, if there's enough solar flare happening, it'll allow it to kind of get in there a little bit more. So this is in Iceland um, on, a, on a trip from a couple years ago. And this is from Finland. And then knowing also, choosing locations and, and choosing the right um, hotels, Airbnbs, 
wherever you try to be. I think I, I'm really excited about Airbnb because you get into neighborhoods more. So with Airbnbs, now you, instead of exploring, instead of being placed in a touristy area, you actually can act, enjoy a neighborhood in a different city, you know, and really get that, that, that feel for it. We knew about the, um, the famous glass igloos in Finland, and it was like, we have to go here. We have to make sure that at least one of our nights is at this location, because how cool is that? You know, we were already shooting the auroras, you know, all around it, and it was happening from about seven o'clock at night, and we all went to bed at two, maybe three in the morning, and it was still going on. So luckily for me, I just went to glass igloo, I set up the tripod and the camera right above my head as I lay down, and it kept taking pictures you know, throughout the morning, until, until the morning light. So that was a really, really unique. But finding these, there's, there's really unique places. You can stay in castles in Scotland and in Germany. You can stay in ice castles in the Arctic Circle. There's really unique places that kind of will make your experience, again, richer, you know, if we, make, if we make it. There's lighthouses you can stay in. How cool is that to stay in a lighthouse? And not all of it is terribly expensive. You know, a lot of it, are, people are just finding new ways to kind of, tourism is at an all-time high, so they're finding new ways to kind of generate revenue for these, for these places. But it's important, again, to become the untourist. You know, and I, again, I, and that takes, you know, that takes a little bit of travel knowledge. I mean, I, I didn't learn to become an untourist until probably two years ago. <laughs> because it's hard. We go to these locations and we're going to, we have to, you know, you know, are you going to tell me you're going to go to Yosemite and not take a picture of Half Dome? You know, you're not going to go, you're going to go to Paris and not take a picture of the Eiffel Tower? You know, that's, that's hard, but how, how do we get a unique picture of it? You know, how do we go to maybe the places, sure, go to the museums, but don't take another picture of art that's already there, or if there is at least statues we can reinterpret a little bit with choosing different angles or different lenses or something like that. You know, I've gone to a ton of churches because that's where almost all the art in Europe is besides the museum, but going there and looking for the people, you know, looking for the moments, the smaller moments that are happening, that that can really symbol, uh, symbolize what's really going on in that, in that area. So becoming an untourist and not looking, you know, get the museums out of the way. I used to be, when I first started traveling, I brought my girlfriend, now wife, to Europe for the first time in 97. And we, we were on a pace for the first like two weeks. It was like two to three museums a day. It was just this, this, this pace that was, I look back and I don't know how I did it. You know, it was grueling, but I had an agenda, you know, and I would write it out. It's the most unorganized I ever, I, I ever am. I'm like writing out the whole, we gotta see this, this, and this, and this, and this. And finally we got to Barcelona and she's like, we're chilling. We are chilling, we're not doing anything, that's it. You know, we're just gonna take a day off. And that was actually one of the best days on the trip. And we just went out and explored. I mean, it doesn't hurt that half the art in, Bar in Barcelona is Gaudi, is all the architecture, and it's outside. So of course we went to the park and we enjoyed that. But just walking around there is so amazing. So don't, for, you know, balance your trip. You know, definitely we wanna go to some museums, but don't, after one, I, I think you can only really go to one museum a day. You can really only have about three hours of it, because then after that, your just mind shuts off. You're feeding it too much, and you have to either take a break, you know, come back later, or just take a break and go to the park, you know, go someplace else. Um, and there are, are plenty of places in all the cities we travel to that represent these cities more so than the museum. The museum is just showing you artists that this museum has has you know gotten one way or another, but it's not representative of the city. So going to places like the parks, like the flower markets. Like those sort of things, these, the smaller places that the locals are going to. This is uh, Krista Rousseau. I think she's spoken here before. She's a Nat Geo traveler, uh, photographer, and uh, it was wonderful. I got to spend a couple days with her uh, in Cuenca in, in uh, Ecuador uh, last uh, in December. And she's like, I'm going to the, I want to go shoot to the flower market. And we went there, and it was just amazing to see her work the scene. And how, I mean, I unfortunately was at a slight disadvantage because I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> so any sort of language skills is always a plus. Um, I could do as much, you know, I was, I was watching her and being inspired how she was just simply talking, saying, can you hold up this? Can you, can I get, can I take your picture first? Or, you know, for me, I'm going, you know, 
can I? You know, or do you mind? And sometimes yes, sometimes no. But the, you know, obviously, if there can be some sort of a better communication, it's going to also yield better results. But thinking of those smaller places, the markets, the parks, the people congregate, and the people that live there that are the pulse of the city, that's a real rep much more of a representation than the museums, right? Here's another site going back to India. Um, this is Honeyman's, honey, I'm going to slaughter this name, but it's uh, hun, hun, Honeyman's Tomb, I believe, and it's this, this wonderful site in Delhi. And um, a bunch of, this is just one of the structures that were there. And again, I love ruins, ruins okay? Hence the website Ruinism. So I'm attracted to this sort of uh, architecture, structure, um, and I love this, and it was overcast and misty, so I really like the light. This was great. But the best picture I took this day was this one. Again, the people. There was all of these schools that were coming in and leading field trips. And again, the, the people in India are just as a kind of attracted and as, as a curious to you as you are to them. And this girl, obviously she's the leader of this pack. You can tell that, you know. And she was like, you know, she actually, I think she, I, I, looked, at, I looked at what was going on and she's like, Go ahead, take my picture or something, something to that degree. And I'm like, all right. So I, I kneel down. You know, with, with children, you want to kind of get down to their level as well so that get, it empowers them a little bit more. And she just kind of, you know, it's, it's wonderful to just see everyone's face here. Everyone's got a, a definitely a unique face, but she's looking right at the camera. And those are kind of cool. A lot of times when we take street pictures, we're getting sneaky shots, and a lot of them we're not seeing the eyes of the people. That can work, but I think it's always better when we get the eyes, especially when it's a gaze like this, you get those eyes looking right at the camera. That's telling a different story to you, 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 and me, you know, of, of what's going on. So again, as much research as we can do, go with an open mind, and let the place take you on a journey. You know, who would have known that by trying on one Fez hat would lead to a whole Ottoman Empire outfit, you know? <laughs> but I loved it, and I really loved this. This was, uh, one, this was my, uh, my travel picture for many, many years. Uh, and then this statue, which is, of course, is dying to uh, have that head in there, but by adding the camera there as the, as the Roman tourist uh, on that. But really being open-minded, you know, going with a good outline, you know, do the research and go with a good outline, but let, each, let yourself be open every day to be kind of taken on a little journey. So let's talk a little bit about the gear, um, because gear is definitely essential. We're photographers, so we want to have the right gear. This is too much gear. <laughs> this is all the gear that I packed on the Galapagos trip. Now, the Galapagos trip, I was a B&H representative, and I was one of two B&H reps who were asked to bring a lot of gear for the people on that trip to try out. So you could try out an underwater camera, you could try out a long lens, you could try out a new body. You know, so we had to travel with a ton of stuff. Uh, and there's benefits, you know, what, all, what I like about this picture are A, there's two bags, because I believe in two bags on a trip. One bag to carry all your stuff, as sort of the get to, one, to point A to point B, and it's a nice, cohesive, concise way to kind of travel that way, but I like a little day bag. You know, so this is the Peak Design, that's their, these are kind of two new items by Peak Design. I'm big fans of their bags. Um, that's their 30 liter backpack, which can fit a ton of stuff, like two bodies, five, six lenses, laptop, the whole, and a lot of personal stuff too. This is uh, their new slide bag. Um, and this is cool, because this can fit um, a mirrorless camera and like up to like five lenses, or a DSLR and a couple lenses. Um, I was able to fit that, that D500, and that's with the Nikon 200 to 500, that was able to fit completely into that bag. Um, so that's a nice little kind of, you don't want to be shouting out that you're a photographer at some of these places. Sometimes A, it's not safe, or just sometimes you just want to blend in more. So some, a lot of people just bring with a regular backpack with them, or, or a regular bag, and then they kind of wrap their camera gear um, in wraps and photo wraps to protect it. That's a smart way to kind of do it as well. Um, so you're not advertising that you're a photographer. But having two bags I think is key. And also two hats, really good. You know, you got wardrobe changes you gotta be concerned about. So having, having a couple hats is good. Um, and then really kind of a, a really a good way to think about it is what gear are you comfortable with? Things I would not recommend is buying new gear 
right before the trip, or even renting new gear. I know sometimes you know we'll we'll we're going on this as maybe it's a wildlife thing, and we we there's a, a big lens that we never need except for on these specific trips. If you're going to rent something, rent it at least two to three days before you go on the trip. It shouldn't be new in the field. Okay, we shouldn't be kind of fidgeting around and playing with buttons and all that stuff. So whatever gear you're thinking, if you buy a new camera, it better be at least two weeks before the trip because you really want to be comfortable in the field. You don't want to be, you want to be taking pictures like this. You don't want to be taking pictures like this, right? So being comfortable and getting it, and once you have this gear, doing a dry run, packing it, not until four in the morning, the night before the trip, which I have also been guilty of doing, but packing it two or three days beforehand and pack it and go out in your neighborhood or go out, we live in New York, go out in New York with what you think you want to bring and put yourself on assignment before the real assignment. Maybe I don't need this gear. Maybe this is too much. You know, so really kind of, and maybe I'm missing something. Oh my goodness, what, how can I not, I, I, I don't have my cable release. I don't have extra batteries. I don't have, you know, a lens that is really, you know, important to me. So doing that dry run, so packing and doing that dry run a few days beforehand is really, really, really key. Knowing what kind of photographer you are, I, I have, I, I have a thing called finding your focal length. Oftentimes for travel photography, I think the best kind of lens to travel with are these all-in-one zooms. They're like 28 to 200, 300, or, or if you're in a crop sensor, an 18 to two or 300. They're not the sharpest lenses in the shed, but they give you that instant, that instant gratification because you can have one camera, one lens, you don't have to worry about swapping things around. And because we don't know what the day is going to represent to us. We don't know if we're heading out there. Yes, we might know we're going to you know, this spot to do this, but anything can change because we're open to it. So having that variety of that all-in-one zoom is quite helpful. And that's a lens that I always poo-pooed you know, prior to it, but I find it to be a very useful travel lens until you find your focal length. Okay, now finding your focal length, this is how the way we see the world. And yes, it might change a little bit with travel, but this is an easy thing to do. If you, if you have Lightroom especially, that's an easy way for you to look at your favorite, Call together your favorite photographs. And then you go up to the top and you can look at the metadata on each one. What are your favorite photographs that you've taken? It'll show you what lens, what camera was used, as well as what focal length it was used. So knowing that focal length, if I'm always, and that's why having that all-in-one zoom lens is great to have because I have this 28 to 300 lens, yet I'm always stopping at 35. That's my favorite seems to be my favorite focal length. I'm all, I'm, that's the way I see the world. So guess what? You should get a 35 millimeter lens, if that's the case. You should invest in these prime lenses or maybe you know, these, uh, these lenses that represent your focal length. Maybe you shoot a lot at 24, a lot at 50, and a lot at 70. Then maybe you should get a 24 to 70 lens because that's your, that looks like it'll be your workhorse lens. Um, so that really is a great way, because again, the all-in-one zoom lenses, they're, again, they're not gonna be the sharpest, they're gonna give you the versatility, but they're also not gonna be as fast. And when I say fast, um, they're not, their apertures are gonna usually start at 3.5 or 4 at, and go up to like 6.3, okay? So we're not gonna get in as much light when we take the picture, so it might <laughs> slow down our focusing, as well as it's not gonna give us as much uh, lack of depth in the background. Okay, whereas these prime lenses will usually have a fixed you know, aperture. It's either gonna be a 1.4, a 1.8, a 2.8. Usually it's not, that, it's not much slower than that. And with those lenses, now we can operate during the day, at night we also can let in a lot more light, and we can get really some separation, uh, some nice bokeh, some nice depth of field. So find that, you know, experiment, play with the lenses. If you're not sure, Definitely invest in an all-in-one lens. It's not a bad investment. It's gonna help teach you who you are. And then, but then make sure you make those adjustments and get those focal lengths. I'd be surprised, so I found out, I mean, I always thought I'm a wide guy, and I'm working on it. I got the resolution going this year, but you know. But I always, I really, especially with my night photography, I'm trying to, I want more sky. I want 
a little a little bit of the ground and then I want more sky. So usually my favorite focal length at night is 15 millimeters to 21 millimeters. Okay? 15 millimeters is hard to shoot during the day. It is really wide and you better put something strong in the in the foreground otherwise you have a lot of <sighs> shots. They're just not going to be interesting. You know. So I had to like kind of okay, maybe I bring I have like a 15 to 20, uh, 35 zoom lens. So that's, I bring that as my zoom lens and that's, you know, for that super wide drama, you know, but then I also bring with a 35, a 50 fixed. And then on my travels, I really noticed with my, my I brought, I had that 18 to 200 lens and I noticed I'm either going all the way to the end, which means that maybe it's not long enough and I'm just really too far away from stuff too, but the next, the next focal length I was stopping at was a hundred millimeter. So I'm like, okay. So I invested in a, uh, a 90 millimeter lens. That was as close as I could get um, to the hundred. Um, and that has been really a, an awakening for me that I have this now this new focal length. It's a, it's a 90 millimeter, it's an F2 lens. And it's like, it's a wonderful portrait lens, but it's also usually when I travel, I'm, I could just have this and it's a sharper lens than I was. Now I'm missing out a little bit to the 200, but I would have, you know, I'm getting again most of what I was going to be getting with that. So that's that was a nice kind of revelation that I had. And then bringing with unique stuff as well. So know your gear. Don't and and don't bring a ton as well. Uh, that that was a bad example, but I wanted to show you the variety of stuff that's out there. This is me in Iceland, and I you know a big you know I'm a big fan of traveling light, uh, but always having your camera ready. Um, this is the hold fast money maker um, strap, which allows you to kind of, you know, have the wild west. You know, you have the, the the guns on either side. Now, I wouldn't recommend this kind of thing for again traveling around cities and stuff because it is your advertising that you've got gear with you. But for Iceland, where there's you know three million visitors to three hundred and thirty thousand people there, you kind of have the place to yourself to a certain degree. And so I was. This was on a photo excursion, so. I had my camera on one side and then my either my camera or a couple lenses in that pouch on the other, but always on the ready. You know, um, again, I said having that small bag with your camera and your stuff during the day, but I always had a camera ready. And I would usually oftentimes, you know, sometimes I just have it on my shoulder. Other times I'd wrap it, wrap the strap around my wrist and just hold it in my hand. It's a little bit, you know, not as obvious that way. It's just in my hand and I'm, I've got my finger on the trigger. Getting a hand strap, you know, that allows you to kind of relax your hand. It's secure on your hand, but having that, and you're kind of always ready to go um, and take the picture. So this is also, again, the, having that fast lens um, or a small point shoot. I believe this was shot with, um, I believe this was like with the, uh, with the Sony, um, with the RX100, I believe the version three or four, one of those. This is in back to Istanbul. Um, and I always like to go, especially my first night, I'll just go around with a fast point and shoot camera or something small, maybe the mirrorless cameras with, again, a small, fast, fixed lens. Until I get the lay of the land at night, I don't want to bring out my tripod. I don't want to bring out a ton of gear. I want to kind of go out there and explore and get, get the vibe of the place. So as I'm walking around the neighbor, you know, I, I saw this, I think it was selling peanuts or chestnuts um, out there, but it was kind of just lit. You know, just, and, and everything else was kind of the darkness of the night. So I really exposed for him, you know, tried to time it when he was smoking as well. I love the smoke from the chestnuts as well as the smoke from the cigarettes. Exposed for him. And then the rest of it, even though there is action going on, you know, there's a security guy going on over there, a couple walking over there, another couple in the dark. You know, even though there's all this other action, he sort of got the spotlight on him. And being able to keep on shooting, keep on clicking into the night, there's lots of other why we put away our gear and either we could be exhausted from the day of just walking around, you know, or we kind of just sh shut down for the night, you know, just go have dinner and that's it, start for another early morning. But to have something small, fast that we can keep clicking onto the night is really, really key. And just another, just talking about focal lengths and choosing them, I wanted to show you a couple examples. So. <clears throat> It's always good to have a wide lens. You know, we need that establishing shot. So whether that is, again, the 15 millimeter, which I think is, again, very difficult, 
a, a standard wide is something like a 21 millimeter or 24 millimeter. That's sort of the, the standard wide. That's probably we, us seeing the world like this, okay? Whereas 35 is this and a 50 is a little bit shallower. So this is uh, shot at a 20, with a 28 millimeter. Okay, and this sets the scene. We can see the whole thing. We can see the people, we can see the, uh, the rainbow, and we can see you know, you know, everything that's going on here. And so this was nice, and it's a nice establishing shot, but I wanted, with the waterfall, I wanted to get a little closer. I wanted to kind of avoid the people a little bit as well. So I just went in tighter. This is 100 millimeter. Okay, and that's, that's not, it's okay, you know, but there's no sense of place with it. But then I went closer, and, and this is, I believe, with a 200 or 300 millimeter. And this was a trick, you know, with waterfalls, especially for me being a long exposure guy, I'm always defaulting to making it nice and, you know, that, that silky, smooth, flowing water. But I challenged myself to actually try to freeze the water. And something like this, a waterfall like this, I was, this is at 8,000th of a second, and it could have been, it could have been faster. So this is a shot during, you saw how bright it was during the day, right? This, I think my exposure fact on, uh, stats on this are 8,000th of a second, probably five, six to have, get a little depth of field, but that bumped up my ISO in the middle of the day to like between 1,600 and 3,200 to freeze that water. But I really like that. I think I really, this is one of my favorite shots. It's very abstract. Um, I really, and I, I, I got a ton of shots. I just experiment, experimented with this um, and love to go back with a faster camera that can even freeze it and capture a little bit more. So, you know, always again, I love flipping that coin. If it says it's supposed to be this, do it the other, try, get that, but then try it the other way as well. There's also some other tools um, we can, I, I often travel with a pinhole camera. A pinhole camera is the first type of, of camera that's been out there. It's just literally a box with a pinhole in it. I shoot film, this was uh, shot with chrome uh, film, and I, I try to always kind of carry this with, just to give me a different way to see, a different way to capture. Now, a pinhole camera, its aperture, which is a fixed aperture, is usually somewhere between 130 to 250. Um, so that already is gonna push your exposures. If we're gonna take a bunch of pinhole cameras to Times Square right now, we'd probably be at, a, you know, the minimal shutter speed would probably be 15 seconds. But think of that, 15 second exposure in Times Square, that could be a cool shot. So knowing that it's pushing you to these long exposures, I was renting a, a bicycle in Amsterdam and I was like, you know what? I, want, I wonder what would happen. What if, you know, always ask yourself, what if? And I wonder, you know, if I were to attach this, I had this uh, little tripod, tripod uh, tabletop tripod that has Velcro around it called the UltraProd. I attached it right to the frame and pointed it so we would get the wheel, and then I tried to bike as, as straight as I could, and this is, I believe, um, a 20 second exposure. I had no idea what it was gonna look like. I did it like four, three or four times, you know, and one or two of them came out and came out with something useful. But again, kind of pushing those, using tools that'll push your vision along um, or let you experiment um, is really, really, again, a, a fun and a new way to uh, play with travel photography. When on my last trip to Galapagos, I was totally addicted and, uh, to doing 360 degree images. I wanted to actually take a 360 degree representation of each island that we went to. Um, I missed a couple, unfortunately, so I, I guess I'll have to go back. But, um, and this, is, this can be tricky because this is, um, I always, I want to place, because 360 degree camera can be the ultimate selfie camera to a certain degree. If, if I'm always holding it, or I try to use, a, again, another tabletop tripod and use just the, uh, the uh, stock of it there. And that's why he's holding up, Christian here is holding it up. So it's a little away from his hand, so it's not making his hand as big. Um, and, you know, he's sort of taking over the scene. He's going above the world with it. Um, and it's a cool, and I'm less in it. So I was, I was having more people hold it on this trip or I was placing it in the scene and having people walk around it. So you're getting either no people or, or a lot of tiny planets, or as I like to call them, these little prints-like shots. But a wonderful, wonderful way to kind of interpret it. Nikon's got one as well, um, and there's their 360, the Key Mission 360. What's unique about that one is it can go underwater. 
Um, you can actually, we did a lot of snorkeling um, there. And so this is 180 degree, I, just, I cropped it. Um, and this is a 180 degree shot of me snorkeling um, in the Galapagos. But then also going back to that waterfall in Iceland, our phones, this is a iPhone panoramic shot using our phones as a, a way to kind of, kind of clock and get the GPS, um, or there are a lot of cool um, techniques that you can use from, I, I personally think, you know, unless you set up a tripod with a camera, that the iPhone still is the best panoramic, you know, version. Usually if you just do these sweeps with cameras, something gets jaggy along the way. You, know, you always do have to kind of watch out for movement. Movement is tricky. Um, with that, but unless you're gonna set up a tripod with a rig and do every like 30 or 40 degree shot, um, the iPhone is a great, great um, tool to have literally in our pocket. Um, the portrait mode is a great nice, um, new mode on the new i7, uh, that's the reason why I got the i7 Plus um, instead was to get that added bokeh, but it's always something that you have with you, you know, so it's a great way to kind of, you know, all the fun filters and a great way to instantly socialize with that. But again, key I think, Panoramic and the GPS are my two favorite features um, for, the, for the iPhone. That I'll, If it's an important place, I'll definitely click a shot to get that tagged. <clears throat> Clicking around the clock. This is also something, you know, we can say that we want to go, we definitely want to make sure that we're shooting early in the morning, late at night, you know, those magic hours. But listen, we're there, we're in, for this instance, we're at in Agra, we're at the Taj, you know, we're in this location, we're gonna probably take pictures all day. So how do we succeed? You know, where, where are the benefits of, of making sure that we're starting early, taking the breaks, or continuing to shoot during the day, as well as getting some nice stuff um, twilight to night. So uh, we, made, we made sure that we were the first ones at the Taj. The Taj can be a overcrowded um, with people, um, once a a after nine o'clock, that's when all the buses come in. So getting there at 7 a.m. We got there at 7 a.m. We were one of like 20 or 30 people there. We had the whole place to ourselves for an hour. And it was a beautiful overcast and misty morning that just really lent itself. We went back later and this, this light was just harsher and not as pleasing. So it was really just getting up early and getting to those locations, you know, early is, is really, really beneficial. But I, I really love, you know, people will often say, ah, well, then we'll take off the afternoon, we'll take off the midday, that harsh light. We'll play it. If it's harsh light, find architecture, find structure, find something. Even, you know, doing street photography in harsh light gives that a harder scene, you know. So I really, um, this was also um, in India, this, this is this really cool structures, um, astro, uh, astro, astro, um, astronomical structures that were, they were keying in and following you know, all the, all the movements, all the celestial movements, like thousands of years ago. And it was just, and these structures are still there. And it was amazing. I was just kind of dissecting them, doing detail work and playing with these harsh light, harsh lines um, and contrast, building that contrast. Um, so if you have that light, work with it, make it, you know, make it interesting. And of course, the magic light at the end of the day. This is something, again, we're in Galapagos. Um, it's near the end of the day, and there's the, the, we're right along the ocean. There's actually a little blowhole that's kind of spewing this mist and the golden light. It's just, it's magic, you know, and you have to take this picture. We're, we planned this trip just to go to this location at this time to get these kind of shots, and it was just, and then just waiting for these m little moments to happen um, there is really, really nice. But then, you know, once that magic hour you know, we have the golden light, which is right now, but then we also have the twilight. And, the, and those, there's three levels of twilight, but getting that, especially the civil twilight, which is when the sun first dips below the horizon, um, getting that, the sky is really blue. And that's when a lot of the, the city lights, when the city starts to awaken, and we get the beautiful blend of the city lights and the blue, that, that blue hour sky, that civil twilight hour. And that's a great way, I kind of, I knew about this. This is actually in um, Madrid. And I found this ancient Egyptian, you know, ruin that was there in this little park. Um, and I was like, you know what, I, I found out about it. And I said, well, I've, I saw that they had lights. I went there and scouted during the day. I said, they've got lights here. 
That means it's gonna turn on. I know the park closed soon after um, dusk, but I was just gonna wait there until they ushered people out. Hopefully I'd get, I'd have at least 15 minutes, 20 minutes of shooting until you know they, they ushered people out. And that's also, you know, a lot of the parks that you'll find, let's say open from dusk to dawn, you know, um, on them and just be there. And those are some of the prime times to be there. And then, you know, obviously when the time comes when they ask you to leave or sometimes they don't, you know, parts of Central Park, you know, they say are open dusk to dawn, but I've shot there well into the night. You know, if you're gonna go to those locations, something like that, going to a park or something, obviously bring friends with as well, just for safety reasons and for the enjoyment of shooting. So this was really, really fun. But what do we do about, you know, those overcast days? You know, we went to Iceland and it was, rain was predicted. We were there for 14 days. It probably rained 10 of the 14 days. But magically, every day but one, every time we got out of the bus, it turned to a light mist. And we were able to take pictures and we were able to continue on. And, and that, the overcast days really create beautiful lighting. This, again, back to the Galapagos, this is actually shot 10, 15 minutes after that golden hour. This is around the bend, so the light wasn't hitting, and we're just getting sort of that, the, sort of the, that bland, goal, uh, you know, overcastness in the day. So, and, but this is white on white, so it's a nice moment anyways, and just waiting for those moments to happen. Soft lighting. Getting that sun behind the clouds can create a really wonderful soft light that can be really beneficial for your photographs. Scotland, another location, you know, like Iceland, that is constantly overcast or constantly raining for the most part. So how do you dodge those times or how do you add drama to those clouds? You know, by, you know, we'll, we'll underexpose a little bit, so we'll make sure that we, those, the, the skies, if we're gonna include the sky, we have to underexpose a little bit so those skies are not getting blown out, that there are still a little bit of detail in those skies, okay? But this is a wonderful, I took about five or t different, five or 10, this was actually the first shot I took as soon as we parked in the parking lot. This is the first shot I took, and then we walked around, I took five or six other angles to kind of get a pseudo reflection. We were there at the wrong time of day because you know the, it was low tide. So I really wanted to get more of a reflection of the castle um, in the water. At, but here I was really, this was the time we were allotted on the trip. So we have to make do with what's best. And I took five, you know, I worked the scene, went to five or six different angles, you know, but again, when I looked at it, I looked at him again last night, I said, which one, this is still the best one. You know, just the angles just work just right. And I love the clouds as well in this one. So at the beginning I said, you have to kind of combine all different types of photography um, to make a travel photographer. So let's take a little dip into a few of those. First one, I think, Again, a lot of us will probably want to embrace some street photography. Still in Scotland, I, we were in Edinburgh. This was during um, the uh, theater festival, um, the, the fringe festival that goes on. And we had just, I was jet lagged. I just got in, you know, and we checked into the hotel and we're like, just showered and we're like, okay, I guess we're up. Let's stay up for a little bit. We'll just have an early night. And we just went out. And there was all these people, you know, just trying to promote their, there's like, I don't know, there's like 10,000 shows going on in two weeks or something. There's a show going on everywhere. And these are little vignettes of the shows going on. So I really, and I'm surprised I acted this way, but you know, that's, this is my hand receiving the, the pamphlet that, that she's giving out. So I have my hand, so I'm like, it, you know, I'm one with the scene. So I'm, I went out like with this hand and I went with this one and just got, again, this is shooting probably with that 21 millimeter uh, lens is a little bit more on the wide side to get this, but again, getting out there, um, and you know, J Jay Maisel has, has a really uh, a famous uh, quote, I think, and that you know, when we're doing street photography, when we go out there looking for pictures, you know, you basically find the stage, and then you wait for the actors, wait for the players to arrive. And that's, you could just, and a lot of what Jay does, he'll, say, he'll find nice, a nice colorful part of a building. And then I'll just wait there for interesting people to walk by and kind of get the vignette or wait for something to happen. Again, this goes back to, there's amazing and beautiful things here in our backyard. You know, uh, there's a, a wonderful movie uh, called uh, Smoke. Harvey Keitel plays a photographer who takes a picture at the same time, at the same corner, every day for like 30 years and he's got this collection and it's just amazing to look at this collection of work and seeing who's there, the regulars that are continually going to work or what happens when someone is a regular all of a sudden 
is not a regular anymore. So it's a wonderful, you know, again, there's pictures to be taken everywhere. But again, so finding that stage and waiting for the players to happen. Well, I lived in, um, in Greece. I lived in a, uh, well, a medium town called Patra. And um, I used to go to the market every weekend. And the market, again, is full of photographic opportunity. So I'd often go there, do the shopping, and I'd stick around, you know, for a little bit to see what happened. And this one day this happened, and this was just was one of my all-time faves. And it just, you know, I saw her coming, I just dropped to my knees. And this was with a film camera, and this is, I, I think there's only one or two shots of this. This is not a rapid fire camera. This is a very manual click, wind, click, wind. So I think I only got two or three shots, but again, her looking at me, you know, framed by the people, you know, that are just doing their shopping, and the dichotomy of the young and the old. Together, it's just a one, really wonderful, wonderful um, shot. They, and I waited, you know, I went to that stage, so going to these parks, going to these places where things happen, or finding that interesting street and just wait for something to happen is a, you know, a wonderful, wonderful assignment to put yourself on. Also, I was immersed myself with going to a bunch of, this is a restaurant in Madrid we went to afterwards, and it was known as the, I think it was the guitar bar or something, and all these guitars come out and start singing, and everything is, 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 is everyone is chaotic and fun and, and having a blast, and I had that little point and shoot camera that I always have with me at night, and I kind of would just, I was with part of the scene, I was kind of dancing and hanging out with people, but then stuff started happening, you know, and I was like, this is, this is wonderful photographic material, this is wonderful capture of this moment, it's kind of bringing, you know, he's looking at me, they're in one moment, there's so many different little moments kind of going on right now, but also framed by the kiss. And landscape, landscape, you know, I default to a lot of this kind of work um, when I'm traveling. Um, so knowing that, knowing the places to go, the times to go, and having the right equipment. This was um, uh, a similar shot to when you saw me with, uh, with the gear on it, it was along the, that same area. But this was a shot, I could only do this with a 15 millimeter, right, to get this double uh, waterfall going on. Everyone else, we all went to this spot, because this is as far as you could go before going down to the chasm. <laughs> but you can only go so far, um, and everyone else's shot, every, I think the widest someone else had was like 21 millimeter. So no one else was really able to get both of the, the double waterfalls at the same time, where I just loved that. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, wow, that's, that's a crazy face. First off, this, this face that kind of that's going on framed by the waterfalls. But I worked this scene and it was just really, you know, thank goodness I had that super wide, you know. If you want to do landscapes, you might not use it a lot, but having it in your bag, having that super wide ready for a moment like this is key. And just, you know, getting the minimal framing, making sure there's just a little bit of the sky up there that can give us sort of the sense of place and giving enough room for the waterfalls to come together as one and then go out of the scene. And that lushness that's there, um, so again, having that super wide, but also looking for the human element. This is another location in Iceland and, and another waterfall. I mean, every waterfall we saw just kept be getting better than the other. First was the big one, then there was the double one, then there was the triple, then there was the infinity, you know, it was, but, <laughs> but this is, we were going down to this, uh, this area we called Hobbit Land, which was going down into this area that there was just pockets. Everyone kind of divided up into went to different little pockets of, of areas to shoot. Um, and using, again, the human element to give the sense of scale to the scene. That's just as important in landscape, you know, as it is into the street and the city shots, you know. But this, with, uh, you know, without him there, it's a nice shot. But with, with him there in this shot, it's, it's just kind of, again, gives you that sense of place. And this is in Capitol Reef. This is at night. Um, we went to this spot, um, and I was with uh, two of my other uh, friends and co-teachers at National Parks at Night, Lan um, Matt and Chris, and we went to the spot. Well, it was pretty obvious. The, the, the spot was called Panoramic Point. So we knew when we did our sort of our scouting prior to going out at night, we did a lot of scouting during the day, um, and we knew we wanted to come back to this. And as soon as we saw this nice S-curve, you know, uh, for, the, for the road going through, we're like, you know, we have to do something cool with that. And so we had at this uh, pixel stick, which is basically this long 
was about this big, and you can kind of program in different colors, different shapes, sizes. So we just kept it simple, um, and Chris and Matt, Chris actually held it out of our moon roof in our car, and I was signaling. I was the one that was kind of triggering all of our cameras back at home base, um, and I was triggering, telling them, relaying to them with a flashlight when it was time for them to kind of go, because we didn't want any of their the car lights to go on during this, so they kind of had to coast through this because we just wanted the red light of the pixel stick to kind of carve its way through this S-curve. So doing scouting, you know, with the landscape, whether it's for day or for night, you know, again, we'll shoot maybe in the early morning or in twilight, but don't just pack it up during the day. During the, those days, maybe you're not shooting as much, but you're looking at what scenes are gonna be interesting. Um, I use an app um, called uh, the uh, Photo Pills that also tell me where the sun will be, where the moon will be, so I can kind of also gauge that st stuff to help me kind of figure out what it'll look like as best as possible before going out again. But doing that, doing that scouting and going with a shot list. You know, we say go, when we travel, going with an outline, but during the day, going out there and, and, and assessing what's going on and then kind of taking notes and preparing a shot list that I might, if, I, if we have time, I might be at this location, and right now the light's not great, but this would be a good location if we can kind of gauge the sun's gonna set there, there'll be a wonderful, either we'll capture the sunset or we'll get beautiful light from it. So kind of coming back and planning those, saying, okay, I wanna be here at five o'clock on one of the next days that I'm gonna be here. You know, and even if it's not, doesn't happen for this trip, you know, take a picture, a snapshot, you know, so you can remember it, but then also make sure you take notes. Taking notes is a key thing, you know, to do. And it's so easy, again, with the phones. I use up all my notes a lot or do verbal notes, you know, with it, and it's great. The landscapes, but let's also uh, forget cityscapes and how we can hopefully uh, either capture the essence or reinterpret the city, how it can be seen. This was shot, um, obviously, from the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but I like that we really, the only little, little bit of the Brooklyn Bridge is just right over there because I'm under the other frame of it. So, but this happened um, on when they have the 9-11 uh, lights, the tribute to lights on, but also when all the cars are coming through as well, that's the, the lights, the movement, that essence, which usually essence and movement go together. So that's where it's beneficial to kind of do that twilight to night photography or I'm traveling a lot now with my neutral density filters for not landscapes, but, but for cityscapes. So having a six stop, a 10 stop, maybe even a 50, I think they have a 15 or 16 stop neutral density, but having those with you, and again, let's go to Times Square. Let's take a shot of that with a tripod, you know, and you, with a 16 stop neutral density, you're probably looking at a four minute exposure in the middle of the day. So again, we can get these sort of creative and new ways. Here's a shot, again, with neutral density filter. Um, this is Coney Island. Okay, and I give it sort of an IR treatment a little bit post to kind of just enhance the contrast and the grain, but this is an eight second exposure in the middle of the summer. And then, you know, I think we're all here, you know, because we have uh, a passion for travel or that the new phrase for it is that wanderlust you know to to go on that journey you know and what will happen what what will what, you know what will we unearth what will we dis discover you know and this is uh, again another uh, rendition of the 360 camera I set it on the ground I walked away from it about 30 or 40 paces and triggered it from there but letting yourself be open you know um, so for example in Venice um, go to St. Mark's Square, I could never go the same way <laughs> more than once. It's the main square, but there's so many, in Venice, there's so many just little, you know, alleys that you go through that I could never, I know the general direction I wanna go, but I never, and I've been there, I've, I've been there for two weeks, you know, total, I've never been able to walk the same way twice, and I like that. I actually like that, because I like, even when I'm on, you know, even when I'm at home, I always try to, hey, we haven't walked down this street in a while, let's go check out this. So always kind of dis that, that sense of discovery. I found a, uh, you know, on, on one of the days that I was just kind of wandering around, we discovered they were, um, we found them uh, draining part of the canal. 
It doesn't smell good. Let me just lay it out. <laughs> it doesn't smell good. However, the picture is quite unique and quite different than the typical ones people get of all the canals, the reflections, and all that sort of stuff. So I really like this shot a lot. This has been a popular one for me. But get, kind of leaving yourself be open to kind of just exploring. Don't walk the same way twice. I, again, I was in Kajaraho um, in India, and we just wanted to go around a neighborhood. And uh, we bumped into these, we heard this, this, uh, all these kids playing sort of through, I felt like I was sort of in Huckleberry Finn or something like this. We, it was like kind of through two broken slats. We just kind of saw them kind of playing cricket in here. So we looked in and they're like, oh, come in, come in, come in. And they invited us to play cricket. Now, I'm a big baseball fan. And unlike, you know, cricket, you know, I got up to bat and I swatted that and it went, phew, all the way out there. That's the wrong way to play cricket, I soon discovered. <laughs> you, if you hit it out of the park, it's an out. Plus we had to go like look for their ball for like you know, <laughs> 15, 20 minutes. We did find it, but this is like right soon after, they were like, ah, what are you doing? You know, and I'm like, click, 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 let's go find it. You know, but it was a really wonderful kind of getting yourself uh, immersed in that neighborhood, discovering that, figuring out, you know, and playing with uh, those moments that happen, letting yourself be open to that. Vantage points, this is a key, key thing, is that we don't always want to be five to six feet above sea level when we travel. We want to get up to good vantage points. We want to, you know, try not only shoot, you know, not always up here, but get down low, get at different sort of angles. But I always wonder, usually this is our first day in, uh, in Cuenca, and I was like, where's the highest point in Cuenca? I want to get to a nice vantage point. So I kind of talked to the B&B &B where we were staying at. And he was like, oh, this is a really cool area right up here. And it's got a beautiful view of the city from there. So I went up there and you know, I, I, I took this picture. You know, I've got other pictures of just breaking down the city, but I liked her because, again, the sense of scale in it. And then this is actually from atop one of the churches. I only went into the church because I wanted to go. They, I, I saw that they had like a roof to get up to. So I went up to the roof. And that's actually pointing, see that long road going through here? That's pointing back to the hill that I was on earlier. So I thought that was kind of cool. And again, different vantage points, different takes, and different ways to see the city. This is the uh, famous church in Reykjavik. And uh, they had a really nice, the rainbow flag kind of leading its way up to the church. So I thought that was your nice wide establishing shot. And then I came in a little closer and got the sort of the medium telephoto shot um, of it. But then we went even a little closer, and then I definitely was going up to the top to get a kind of a bird's eye view of the city. Now we can see the sort of the rainbow in reverse from there, and a breakup of all the, you know, I saw that the buildings were, were kind of colorful, but a lot of the rooftops were quite colorful as well. So that was really a nice and unique way to can see the city. Looking for advantageous angles, you know, again, using, if you're gonna use those wide angle lenses, get in close, get, make sure there's foreground. This is the way to the monastery and I waited, I framed up this shot and I waited, you know, I was there, I was probably around here for a good five, 10 minutes waiting for different people to walk by. I first took the shot, figured out the exposure, got that, but then waited for interesting people. This couple uh, won it for me. And this is the, uh, uh, Sophia uh, Church and was also you know, a mosque, really one of the most uh, beautiful places in Istanbul uh, to go to. I'd been there before, this was my second time there, and, and it's just, it's, okay, what, what am I photographing that's different than these people? There's you know, hundreds of people in here, we're all doing, we're all taking pictures, and it's amazing, so it's going up, different angles, looking for abstracts, but I wanna get that wide establishing shot. And, uh, and through this doorway, I saw there was like the little lip you know, and so I was able to kind of angle my camera. I just put it right on the ground, but the lip angled it up a little bit. So that's also nice to always, if you always have like a notepad or something with you to give it a little bit of uh, angle up, because if we're just flat, it would have been just too much ground. I didn't want hardly any ground, you know. So I was able to use the lip, angle it up kind of perfectly so the people were all in it. No one's really getting cut off. Got the frame of the door, you know, but this museum, this church mosque now turned museum, you know, it's all about, you know, the dome and all the decorations, you know, both Greek Orthodox 
and you know, uh, the, uh, in the other, the Muslim decorations as well. It's a combination, the blending of both of those that makes this place so fascinating and beautiful. And, and so I was able to play around with this and the, these shots were usually anywhere from one second to four second. She got a little movement of the people, but it also minimized the people. I like that they're there. You know, oftentimes we're kind of trying to avoid them, but I like that they're there, but they're, but what you're really looking at, you're looking up top first, right? And then going down with this. So again, advantageous angles, going down low, looking up high. You know, in Crete, all, on a lot of the islands, the beautiful white painted buildings, you know, and the blue, rich blue sky that you can get. I spent a whole, I, a whole day or two just shooting up. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I've, Wait, I've never seen this way before. And it was so cool and start framing things differently and seeing things differently like this. And now we can kind of play again with abstracts and, and stuff like that. And it was just, again, don't just think here, right? Up, down, and get, put yourself all around. The detail shot as well, you know, we want to have that wide establishing shot, but getting the detail shot, getting in close. You know, this was, we went over to this artist's house and I was just enamored with all the rich colors that she was using. And I just wanted to kind of frame in and go in tight with all these wonderful, wonderful colors. So getting that, that detail shot can be just as establishing. Um, in Finland, we went on a, a, a husky sled and it was like brutal. We went through snow and it was like holding on for dear life. This was the best tasting hot chocolate I've ever had in my life. We earned it and as soon as we got in, you know, they started pouring it and the smoke coming out. And this is actually my, 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 uh, my lens, the mist coming here is really the, the uh, fog from my lens, you know, because I'm going from outdoors where it's like 20, 10 degrees to going indoors where it's 40. <laughs> not, ter not terribly warmer, but again, a little bit of that mist, but I think it added actually to the scene, but I was constantly having the cloth there to kind of wipe it and clean it, which is always another good thing. I, as a glasses wearer, always have a cloth, but you know, making sure that your lenses and your gear is always clean, clean it every, every night when you get home, give it a good you know, once over so you can go out the next day. The detail shot and abstracts. You know, so if we go to the museums, this is um, the um, theater in, in Iceland, which is famous you know, because it has all of these abstract. We didn't go to see a show. We went inside for free and just wandered around and did this sort of lesson in uh, capturing abstracts, capture and creating abstracts throughout there by just kind of zeroing in on all these abstracts, but also abstracts and reflections go hand in hand. Um, you know, waiting, I went by several of these windows and each one was having sort of a different reflection. Some I had with people cleaning um, around them as well, or I put someone on the other side, but it was the, kind of the simplicity of this half reflection that kind of won it for me. So looking for those light, another key thing, you know, during that, um, during those times between 10 and two, where we can see where the reflections are landing um, and kind of create really interesting images, either just with the reflections or showcasing them. And then I the think the challenge of it all is to create a story and immerse yourself in a story. A lot of what we're taking are, are shots, but how are they tied together? How are you gonna best represent the slideshow to your family, to your friends, to, on your portfolio, our website? You know, how to really, you know, so that's where that research and what you like kind of comes really back to that. Obviously, we've kind of discussed, I have a little bit of a hat issue. Um, and the, really, the reason I was going to Ecuador was going to the Galapagos, but I, the year before, I went to Quito, which was the capital city, a beautiful city, one of the highest cities in the world. I actually saw a volcano in the distance smoking the whole time, and that was beautiful. But while I was there, I learned that the Panama hat is actually made in Ecuador. You know, and that it's this, one of the, this little town, Cuenca, the small mountainous town, it's really that there, one of the major, uh, it's like these two towns with Cuenca being one of the, 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 the other, the major one, I guess. Um, they the, have almost the companies making them there. They're made, what I found out also a little bit later, was they're made in the villages. Obviously first, they're taking the straw and the women and men are kind of putting them together and they, what the, the manufacturers, the factories get are a raw form of this 
at first, and then they do all the dyeing and all the shaping and all that sort of stuff like that. So I did this trip, and one of my coworkers, they said, we're going to Cuenca, I gotta go investigate this hats, these hats more, and we have to delve into this story. So we went there, we, first we went to a couple of them, they have actually have hat museums there, we went to the hat, couple of hat stores, and then they're making hats there, and you basically had full access to these locations. So I was able to kind of work with them and kind of just take a look at the behind the scenes of, um, of the hat places. So here we are, and I actually, there's a, a, funny, a funny picture of me. I probably can, kind of come up to about here on the stacks of hats. Um, they have to make 300 hats a day at this location right here. That's their the big poster in their, in their, in their uh, office, 300 hats a day. So, but here you can see kind of, the, you know, these are the raw hats. Though they've been shaped, given a basic shape, they still need to be trimmed and further shaped from there. So here's kind of uh, the hats laying around. Um, as some of them have been dyed, again, some of them still need to be trimmed. This is the, the straw that they use. Okay, so they have just some of the raw straw. I hung out with this guy for, for quite a bit, and I like playing again with that movement. He was counting all the hats that were just kind of coming out of the, 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 this washer machine. Um, so he was counting and throwing. And I noticed, you know, first, like, the first couple shots, I was like, okay, I'm freezing the action, but he's moving quick enough that I could probably capture this, I believe this was like a 15th of a second. So a trick with shooting at the shutter, you know, most of the time we're told shutter speeds really shouldn't be lower than 1 25th or 60th of a second. It kind of depends how long your lens is. But if you go into your burst mode and kind of turn yourself into a tripod, then you can click off. And I can usually get 15th of a second down to a quarter of a second. Now I go into burst mode, I'm gonna hold down. Because that first one or two shots, they're gonna be blurry because I'm triggering the camera. But by the time the third or fourth shot has happened, I'm gonna get, out of 10 or 15 shots, I'm gonna get two or three winners. A little bit tricky to edit or a little bit more hard work to edit, but I think uh, that movement, that, that sense of movement you can add to the scene is worth the, uh, the edit. And again, a little bit of movement of this guy. These are, so these are these, um, these are all the different shapes. So they would put the hat kind of in these and then there's one of those molds in there and then they press that down, you know, for a good 30 seconds to a minute. And that's what kind of gives it its, its one of its final shapes. They might then put the crown, the different types of crowns in. Uh, as well. You use the old school coal irons as well. And it's getting again another, all of them laid out to dry, all the different dyes and stuff. Shot with the iPhone. And then the final, the attaching of the inner band and the outside band. And in the end, this was the hat I chose. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it was easy to pack. It was easy to pack. So that was my, my, my micro story that I kind of worked on while I was there. There, I was another, I was, and that's the one I knew I was going to go to, but what also en entranced me while I was in Cuenca was all the wonderful graffiti that they had going on. And this was one of my Instagram posts while I was there. So this was a combination of nine of my favorite um, graffiti shots that I saw from there. And I kind of put them together like this, but I was really, you know, when we would just walk the streets, we were looking for obviously interesting people, or we we're looking, we we're kind of on graffiti hunts, and we we're going to different neighborhoods that would lead us to different neighborhoods, and for looking for murals, and all that sort of stuff like that, and then again, waiting in front of murals for, again, that could be a stage, waiting for the players to come in. But let's not, so, just what we've seen so far has been all photos, you know, still photographs, but. Let's also make sure, I'm trying harder and harder to always bring with a little audio recorder. And I definitely, I have some great video of um, the Panama hat or the Ecuadorian hat story that I like, that I feel tells, helps tell the story a little bit more. So the more we can kind of do that, almost every mirrorless camera or DSLR can record video. You know, so there's that. You don't need to bring with another, another camera. But I do think that having like a small recorder whether it's you recording your own notes or you know, you're just capturing some audio, whether it's the church bells going off, whether it's the people, the murmuring of the people in the crowd or you know, anything else that you kind of encounter. These are all things that can, you can add 
to your slideshow, add to your presentation to really make it you know, more effective. So back to the uh, guitar bar. This is sort of uh, a video I took. Oh, though I don't have the audio. We forgot to add that. But as you can see, there is audio, <laughs> uh, the guitar. But this is sort of a, a look at um, the inside of how packed it was. I believe that's there's the couple right there that was kissing earlier or later. You want to add? Yeah, sure. Oh, why not? For, for all the audience. Uh-huh. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Here we go. And now... <laughs> Get up and dance. <laughs> everyone's singing. You know, everyone's, everyone knows this song. So. so again, capturing those little moments. Yes, the picture that I had and some of the pictures I had from that scene, but that music is so essential, you know, and so part of that scene and part of that memory that we need. It's it's our duty really to kind of capture that to help us even remember it further. This is a little time lapse. Time lapse is, is, is a super fun way to do, whether it's on your phone, this one was shot on a phone, um, or whether it's you compiling it in a video. This is us getting ready to board our the um, en Endeavor 2 ship. Those yellow ones are taxi boats. And here we are coming into the boat. We leave our luggage. They bring it in for us. It's beautiful. And off we go. So kind of these sort of like, this is sort of a moment that we all kind of walk past or take for granted, the simple thing of loading onto the boat. But if we think of it, capturing it in a creative way, like a time lapse, you know, again, it helps us tell that story a little bit more. And the true souvenirs, you know, obviously, we feel obligated to bring back chocolate from Ecuador or gifts for our coworkers or friends and stuff like that. But the real true souvenirs, and let's not forget this, are the snapshots as well. The pictures you take with either, you know, here's my dad and I in the Taj, here's some of the friends of, at the wedding, here's us at, at uh, Dry Tortugas, that we were befriended the ranger there, and she was giving us a personal tour on top of the world. And then this is a, a wonderful moment in San Francisco. We saw this artist, we loved his t-shirt, so that obviously, the t-shirt was a wonderful souvenir um, from our trip. But getting our picture and hanging out with the artist and talking to him and getting to know him a little bit better, you know, I don't wanna just remember the t-shirt, you know, I wanna remember that moment, that time. So just making sure we don't forget to take whether it's the silly selfies with you and your friends in front of the monument, that's important too. You know, to remember that we were there um, and with these people that are important to us. So don't forget to do that. And then giving back. Um, this is, uh, when, I, when I went to uh, Varanasi in India, I was able, um, I, had a lot of, I had a couple of photographer friends there and one of them got us access um, to these ashrams these ashrams are these houses for widows. Widows, if you're in a low caste in Indian society, widow, as soon as you become a widow, you're pretty much an outcast. The family disowns you. This is in the lower caste there. Um, so for safety purposes, they cre they've created these ashrams where these women now go and, and, and they can live out the rest of their lives. So we got access and got to hear their stories and spend, we actually was on New Year's Day 2014. And it was one of the, you know, the, the best New Year days of my life, just to, to be able to really share and see these stories. And I went there with a camera like this. This is the Fuji Instax camera. So it, like the old, the Polaroids of yore, you take a picture and you get a little credit card size picture from it. So many people, this is not on the tourist radar. You know, you have to kind of know someone to kind of get in on this, but by going there, they do have photo photographers come through and they say they'll send them pictures and the only way we send pictures now is email. No one in an ashram has email, <laughs> you know? So you really need to send them prints. So by going there and hanging out with them and really giving them the print there, having something like this with you on certain trips, is that is a door opener. It's, it's an amazing thing to give. This is um, a mother and a daughter, both widows. You know, and um, when I gave her her picture, I just met her first, and I took her picture and I gave it to her, and she's like, "Oh my God, 
This is like the only picture I have of me. You know, I want you to introduce you to my mother, and if you could please take a picture of us together. You know, so I went in there. Her mother is blind, you know, but she was talking to her and, and explaining to her, and it was just, I mean, my heart grew like 10 times <laughs> that, that day. It was a really, really um, wonderful sharing way. Let's not forget photography is also so much about sharing, not just with our peers, but with the people, again, that we meet. And having, getting their emails if you can, or again, this makes it simple, it's 75 cents a shot, <laughs> you know? So having something like that to give to them instantly, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So don't forget, you know, to give back and, and share those experiences with the people that you're experiencing them with. Them with. Guys, thank you for your time, really appreciate it.